This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. We're still on Understanding the Kingdom series. This is part 61. And I want to talk about the kingdom staff of authority. Now, in the past few sessions, I want to do a quick review. We discovered that Adam and Eve were given the shepherd's staff of authority in the garden that Adam failed to use it. Jesus came as the second Adam with a new staff of authority and converted Adam's staff into the cross to destroy what the Nechesh had done in the garden. In other words, to set humanity free from the iniquity force. Each believer must use the cross for internal spiritual warfare. Now, I want to stress that. Internal spiritual warfare. You do not do external spiritual warfare until you do internal spiritual warfare. To use the cowboys and Indians colloquium, you do not need Indian shooting from the inside and the outside both. You got to clear the land before you can establish borders. Each believer must use the cross for internal spiritual warfare to drive out demonic influences, thought patterns, and ideologies from within their own souls. Why is this important? What do we learn from Adam? Man has the propensity not to enforce his given authority if the enemy he is facing is aligning with some carnal need that he perceives that he has. We find that with Adam. We also discover with the story of Adam that man has also has the, t the tendency to throw those around him under the bus to deflect his own guilt. We've never seen that, even though it's also called the Washington two-step. We see that all the time. Men and women that walk in the kingdom do not do those things. Secondly, woman has the propensity to being deceived and build relationships with the wrong influencers. But together, if they're walking with God, how many know they balance each other out? I want to look today at Jesus and authority because when he came, he came as the second Adam. He didn't come with Adam's staff at first, he came with a new staff, one that he brought with him from heaven as the second Adam, also representing the new man. If you have your Bibles, I want to go to Mark chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. You know, so many times we, we think that Jesus did everything he did because he was God in the flesh, but we're going to find out that he came as the second Adam. He passed the test. The first Adam failed when when the first Adam failed to use his staff of authority, Jesus, as our example, was constantly using his staff of authority in the earth in obedience to heaven. Picking up here in verse 21, Then they were in Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Now, there's several ways of looking at this. 
First of all, Jesus was the author of what he was teaching. He's the one who gave Torah to Moses. He's the one who told, Torah, that told Moses, go grab your pen, get a piece of paper. I'm getting ready to dictate to you some books. It was Jesus in this face-to-face relationship. You know, it would be the same thing as, as having somebody else teach on one of the books that I have written. They, I, I could teach with a different authority than what they could teach because I could also share my ideas that I had behind what I was saying. Because one of the things that we have witnessed in this day and age, people can read things in black and white and completely misinterpret what's being said. And the scribes and the Sadducees and the Pharisees were doing that by the time of Jesus, that they had so skewed Moses. And they had to, and they had to lean back. We find that we, we dealt with it uh, the Apostle Paul in, in uh, well, I guess that was the Kingdom, uh, Kingdom Intelligence Briefing, so, uh, in Titus, Paul warns us of the, of the uh, basically the fairy tales that uh, the rabbis were using. Well, what fairy tales? You know, what, what folklore were they using? One is called the Great Assembly, that the rabbis teach what oral Talmud came out of with several, several ideas. Number one, that Moses didn't have enough time to write it all down, so he shared it with the elders, and now it was their duty to carry it, but if he would have shared it with anybody, it would have been the Levites. The elders weren't supposed to teach. Others besides Levites were not allowed to teach the Word until the judgment of the Levites in the book of Malachi. That's what allowed the rabbinical movement to raise up. And so, <laughs> there's, uh, what's the other fairy tale? I think the other fairy tale is oral Torah. Okay, you have oral Torah, and then you have what's called the Great Assembly, that they say, well, after, after Babylon, we developed the Great Assembly, and now the Great Assembly, we developed all these traditions, and yada, yada, yada. But I have those within the academic community within Judaism say that there is, there is no historical evidence that the Great Assembly ever existed. What I believe it was, is here you had Jesus coming, speaking with authority, because it came from him to begin with. And his disciples, filled with his spirit, were moving in that same kingdom authority. So how do you come up to withstand that when you're rejecting the one from whom they drew their authority from? You have got to create an authority that allows you to draw that authority from the people. That's actually kind of what we do here in America. Why do the people govern that govern? Because we grant them permission or we grant them authority to lead. Which in essence, in a perfect world, when we withdrew that authority, so cease their authority to lead and to make laws and different things. So one is, is kind of usurped authority where the other is true authority. And Jesus spoke with authority that marveled the people because he could say, this is what Moses said, and this is what he meant, and this is what God meant when he told Moses about this. Jesus is the perfect expression of the Torah of God. He is the perfect example for the believer to walk. He was completely submitted to the authority of the Father, which meant he had delegated authority that wrought in his hand, and that when he stayed faithful to with what heaven was saying, he could move unimpeded with that authority, whether he was speaking, whether he was praying, or whether he was ministering. Anytime you step out of that and begin to try to use authority drawn from the people, then you can only present or you can only offer the authority that the people can give you. That's why many times in the, in the charismatic movements, there used to be an old saying, that's why you end up with services where you have empty hands on empty heads. Because it wasn't by the authority of God, it was by the, uh, the perceived authority being granted by those listening rather than someone representing God himself who had heard from God 
Like Justin Cornwell said that there, had been, there have not been enough ministers that went to the mountain of God and experienced the burning bush. And so when they're wandering in the wilderness, they have never had that experience, so they don't move like Moses moved. And we need to have men and women of God that do that once again. We also discovered that Jesus moved in a new authority. Let's go to Mark chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. So first they were amazed at the way he taught. But after he taught, he wasn't done yet. Verse 27, then they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region about Galilee. You see, Jesus was moving the authority of the second Adam, which was not tainted by the sin of the first Adam. And it was, simply, it was not simply because he was doing it as the creator or proof that he was Messiah. Every time they confronted him and said, prove that you're Messiah, he'd shut him down. He was doing it because the Father said, this demon needs to go. This person needs to be healed. You need to teach this at this meeting. Everything was strategic because he was aligned with heaven rather than because there's only two places you can have your soul aligned to, heaven or the nechesh at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There, there is no middle ground. There is no demilitarized zone. There is no gray space. Sometimes the only gray space that really exists is in between our ears, and, and that's fabricated. What do you mean? I'm moving in what the Nechesh says, and I'm trying to convince myself it's God. That may look gray to you, but to, the, to everything in the spirit realm, it's black, okay? Because you've deceived yourself. But I want to look in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, because I've heard so many say that, you know, Jesus did, did, did what he did because he was God in the flesh. But you need to understand he had to empty himself. Some translations will say he emptied himself of his divine privileges. And what we're getting ready to read here. Philippians 2, starting in verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself of no reputation and took on the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being, in the found, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now I want to read Weist. New Testament translation. If you have ever studied Greek, one of the things you'll end up using is, is Weiss' uh, commentaries on the Greek New Testament, where he'll, he'll give a lot of different translations. And listen to how much detail that Dr. Weiss gives, which also is in Christ, who has always been and at the present continues to subsist in the mode of being in which he gives outward expression of his essential nature, that of absolute deity, which expression comes from and is truly representative of his inner being, and who did not, after weighing the facts, consider it a treasure to be clutched or retained at all hazard, thus being on equality with deity, but himself he emptied, himself he made void, having taken the outward expression of a bondservant, which, which expression comes from and is truly representative of his nature, entered into a new state of existence, that of mankind. So he came showing what a, a, but the new man could be if he would completely and perfectly yield to God. He did nothing because he was divine. He did everything because he was divinely led. He was in perfect obedience. And the book of John tells us that because of that, he was given the Spirit of God without measure. Now, why is this important? Because we start out in our walk, oh, maybe 
10% obedient, then 15% obedient, and then 20% obedient. And as you grow and as you sanctify and as you become more and more obedient to the Word of God and to the moving of the Spirit of God in this sanctification process, the greater that you can move in authority. Jesus is the example when you're stuck on 100% obedience. Are you having fun yet? Let's go to Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. Now, everybody loves to quote this, but we miss the, the steps and the sequence in which this is done. You have the 70 that he gave authority to cast out demons and to heal the sick, okay? And they go out and do it. They were faithful in doing it. They come back blown away. Listen to this, verse 17. And then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Right there, you need to put a little note in your margin. Wow. It blew them away. You know, I saw you do it, but when you commissioned me to go out and did it, and listen to this. I did what you told me to do, and I stopped doing what you told me not to do, and it worked. Put them, boom. Okay? Obedience is better than sacrifice. So after that, Jesus says, okay, I'm, I'm getting ready to take you to the next level of authority. There are levels of authority. There are levels of faith. There are levels of power that we can move in the kingdom of God. And it is directly proportioned to your sanctification, maturity, and obedience. See law. Think about that for a minute. So with that said, let's pick up here in verse 18. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Boy, that's a big statement. Especially when you realize that Satan was represented by Zeus, whose symbol was a lightning bolt. And see, all the way back from the Tower in Babel before, one form or another, Zeus reigned supreme in the world until he got to Jesus. Now you see Jesus' disciples, these 70, 70, 70, very biblical number, 70, going out and doing exactly what he said. Demons were being cast out. People were un beginning to understand the kingdom of God. The dead were raised. The, the sick were beginning to be healed. And Jesus' response was, Somebody is getting knocked off their throne. <laughs> I don't know about you, but see, there's a confrontation coming in the end days where there's, where the, there's principalities and powers. There's these thrones that are, that are governing over humanity. And one of the things, one of the challenges the body of Christ is going to have to be learn how to do is to move in kingdom of power and kingdom authority that by what we do here begins knocking some jacks off the throne. That wasn't even in my notes. That's good. All right. But listen, he says, Behold, I give you authority, authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, which always represent the power of the enemy, and over all, A-double-L, -L, underline that in your Bible, all, all the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice rather that your names are written in heaven. Now, what he just taught to me, he said, listen, I'm getting ready to turn up the power in you, but you've got to keep perspective. If you don't keep the rejoicing of who you're obeying and where your name is written and where you're going, your head will go. <sighs> How many know doing this kind of warfare with the big head will get you killed? Now I want to look at a couple of the words here. Authority, I give you authority over power. Now what's interesting is the word authority here that, that Jesus uses is exousia. Contrasting that to power, which is dunamis. Okay? Exousia 
And, I, and I'm going to be introducing it several times, and each time I'm going, to, I'm going to share with you a portion significant of its definition. Okay? It means the ability or strength which one is endued, which he either possesses or exercises, the power of authority, influence, of right and privilege, the a power of rule or government, the power of him who will, who will and commands must be submitted to by others and obeyed. So we have authority and dunamis. Most Pentecostals love to translate miracle working power. Now what's the difference? I could have the perfect weapon that no foe can stand before. And man, it just has power written all over it. But it's a smart weapon. It can only be used by an authorized user. Anybody ever try to get into your computer and forget the password? And all of a sudden, unauthorized user, unauthorized user, denied, denied, denied. In the kingdom of God, well, the, let me, this is the simplest. We have all these lights here today, right? There, there's a power plant. It could be a nuclear power plant. It, it could be you know, coal, you know, whatever. It could, it, how are they using natural gas? There's massive power behind that. And so we have a 200 amp service coming into this building that is enough to supply all the electrical devices, even when Mary's cooking, I mean, uh, and all the electronics I plug in. But do you know what controls that massive amount of power? A $2 switch. That switch is authority. And with, a, with authority, you can block the power of the power plant. So here you have Lucifer pulling the iniquity force from all sinful humanity, and he's now using it toward their destruction. And Jesus just said, you know what? I gave you a switch to turn it off. You see, first you can move in authority against the enemy, but as you progress in your understanding of the kingdom and you have been faithful, the next procession is to be given this level of authority to where, you know, I, I told Sheila Lazinski, I said, you know, if, if there was a true Christian in the Carrie movie, you know, then back years ago when, when that thing first came out, I was watching every horror movie just like everybody else and stuck on stupid. Where she had all this mind control that she could, you know, throw people across the room, crumble buildings, whatever. That movie would have lasted five minutes. Because she would have been walking down the street crumbling stuff and walked into a believer's. I bind you up in the name of Jesus. I've been given authority and I turn off that power. That would have been the end of the movie. Did you ever notice how he would throw some dumb idiot there trying to be a religious guy? You know, it's kind of like one of those old Jane Juan, J, John Wayne movies where the Indians are about ready to slaughter them all. And the, what does the preacher pray? Lord, we thank you for about what we're ready to receive. You know, no, we don't. <laughs> Lord, stop them arrows. Give us victory, you know. Lord, we just, for what we're about ready to receive, we just get, no, no, no. That's, they, they do that to deflate our understanding of the kingdom. God's kingdom is greater, and the greater it is on the inside of you, the more it can move on the outside. You got to give it space. You have space within your soul that's just like when Israel crossed the Jordan. When you got saved, all the ites were still there. But now you're connected in your spirit, man, connected to the Father empowered by the Holy Spirit. And as I learn to do these things and do what, I, what I, I shared in our last session on that internal spiritual warfare, that's driving out the ites and establishing the kingdom. Drive them out, establish your borders, and then it makes it very hard for them to get in.
Jesus gave his disciples authority over those moving in the iniquity force, authority over those moving in the power and the influence. Oh, I didn't get to read the best part. Are you ready for this? Deutimus also can be the power and resources rising, or wait a minute, the power and influence which belongs to riches and wealth. How many know that there's two places that the Illuminati and the mystery religions draw power to the earth? They draw it from the iniquity force, and in my second book, I, I deal with how that they're trying to master that iniquity force. It's the power of magic. That, that, mad, that power source does not come from Lucifer. We're the, we're the batteries stupid enough to yield to sin and to charge up his kingdom. And we begin walking in holiness, we turn that power off. You're no longer going to, I'm, I'm no longer going to, you know, the last thing I want when the devil looks at me is to neither see an easy button or a Duracell on the side of me. I don't want a power his kingdom. But I'm moving in a different power that's not compatible with that power. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gathered to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the Son of Perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with heaven's power to withstand The Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.